I understand one of them is also going to be reading scripture passage with us from Esther chapter 4. Esther 4. So I can get whoever that is to come forward. The reading. God, the Bible is a very special book. It is so big and so old. What do these old words mean for our lives today? Please send your spirit so that we can understand your word. Amen. Mordecai persuades Esther to help. When Mordecai learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the city, wailing loudly and bitterly. But he went only as far as the king's gate, because no one clothed in sackcloth was allowed to enter it. In every province to which the edict or order of the Lord had come, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting, weeping, and wailing. Many lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her what more told her about Mordecai, she was in great distress. She went and set clothes for him to put on but instead of his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther summoned Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs assigned to, to attend her, and ordered him to find out what was troubling Mordecai and why. So Hathak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him, including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay in the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict for the annihilation, which had been published in Susa, to show Esther and explain it to her. And he told him to urge her to go to the king's presence and beg for mercy and plead with him for her people. Hathak went back to, and reported to Esther what Mordecai had said. Then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, all the king's officials and all the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned to the king has but one law, that he be put to death. The only exception to this is if the king to extend his gold scepter to him and spare his life. But 30 days have gone past since I was called to go to the king. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back to his answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, where you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to the royal position for such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go, gather all the Jews who are in Susa, and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or for three days, night or day, and I, my maids, will fast as well. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. I also have a verse from Ephesians 2, verse 10. Ten. just need to find it. It's in there. Ephesians, Ephesians. Verse 10, right there. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you have a purpose. You've spent any time trying to keep up with the slew of superhero movies that have come out in the last 10 years or so, especially all the ones based on Marvel comics. You've probably come across this guy, a character known as Loki. Now Loki, technically I should point out, technically is not a superhero. He is in fact one of the bad guys. They even call him the God of Mischief. Because he's always up to something. He's always scheming, coming up with plans that would let him take over the world, if not the whole universe. The thing about Loki, though, is even though he is technically one of the bad guys, he's become an enormously popular character. I think part of the reason for that, not only is he clever and charismatic, and as you can see, he's got great hair, very unique sense of style as well, the other thing about Loki is you got to admit he's confident. 
He is certain of himself. Every time he introduces himself, he tells people this line, I am Loki of Asgard, and I am burdened with glorious purpose. That takes some nerve to, to make that the first thing you tell people about yourself, doesn't it? Loki doesn't care. He doesn't care what other people think. He is determined. He is destined for great things. And that way, Esther, at least the Esther we meet at the very beginning of Esther chapter 4, she's almost the opposite of Loki. In a lot of ways, she is the anti-Loki. She does not come across as someone seeking to go out and do great things. Rather, she is someone whom things happen to. Esther's life, at least up to this point, seems to have been determined and dominated by people and powers beyond her own control. And it helps to get some context to know a bit more about Esther and her story. At the very start of her story, we're told Esther is a young Jewish girl. She's an Israelite. And her people, the people of Israel, they had been taken into exile. By this point in their history, some of them had gone back to the Promised Land and were living there again in the land of Canaan. But many of them, rightly or wrongly, they had opted to stay wherever it was their captors had taken them. And in a way, that's because it didn't really matter where they lived, whether they went back to the Promised Land or stayed in exile, because either way, they were still a subject people. They were still one of the many peoples under the control of the Persian Empire, which at that time dominated most of the known world. And so you have Esther told at the beginning of her story. She's part of an ethnic minority. She is part of a people under foreign rule, a people in exile. We're also told that she was an orphan. She'd lost both her father and mother, and back in those days, being an orphan was especially difficult because it meant you could possibly be sold into slavery or even worse. Fortunately, in Esther's case, her cousin Mordecai took her in. He raised her as his own daughter, basically. But then there was only so much that even cousin Mordecai could do to protect his cousin Esther. Because not only was Esther part of a people living in exile, not only was she an orphan, she was also a young woman living in a time and in a culture where women were basically seen as property. They were treated like objects, not as equal human beings. And that comes out especially if you read the book of Esther from start to finish. If you start at the very beginning, we're told that Xerxes, the king of the Persian Empire, he suddenly found himself in need of a new queen. He started off the story with the queen Vashti, but got upset because she would no longer do exactly what he told her to do. And the solution that his royal advisors came up with, they told Xerxes, well, what you need to do is, is go out, have your men round up all the young ladies that look good. You pick the one you like to be your new queen, and the rest they get to stay as part of your harem. How's that? And you might think, well, that actually did work out pretty good for Esther. She goes from being someone in exile, an orphan, to becoming queen. She is now married to one of the most powerful people on the planet, but you realize Xerxes, he's moody. One day you might be his best bud, the next day he might have you executed, and he just doesn't care. He's moody, he's also forgetful. We're told that Esther's cousin Mordecai discovered a plot to assassinate Xerxes. He stopped him from getting killed. But Xerxes never thought to stop and say thank you. He's moody, he's forgetful. He's not exactly an attentive husband. We find out that he would go weeks, if not months, without seeing Esther. So you can imagine, this is hardly a dream come true for her. So you have all this going on in Esther's life, but then in the meantime, we're also told there's the real bad guy in this story, a guy called Haman. Haman, he gets all put out because Mordecai refuses to bow down and give homage to him every time Haman passes by. And so Haman comes up with the plot. Not only is he going to get Mordecai done away with, he also decides, I'm going to do away with all of Mordecai's people, with all the Jews in the empire. 
You might think, hold, hold on a minute, that, that's a bit extreme, isn't it? But there again is more to this story. We're told that Haman was a descendant of Agag who had been king of a people known as the Amalekites. And the Amalekites had been long, long time enemies of Israel. If you think back to the book of Exodus, when Israel leaves Egypt, one of the first things that happened, that happened to them in the wilderness, they were attacked by another tribe, another group of people. That's the story where, where Moses had his hands up in the air and his hands were up, they were winning, and his hands started to fall, they were losing. Well, the enemy in that story, those were the Amalekites. That's how far back this hatred goes. And so from Haman's point of view, this is simply him continuing, finishing the work his forefathers and foremothers had begun. That's just cousin Mordecai. He seems to be very well placed. He keeps coming across these secret plots. He finds out about Haman's plot. And he right away goes to Esther. He, he takes this very sensitive information to the most important person he can think of. But then Esther, Esther doesn't know what she's supposed to do with, with this. What does Mordecai expect from her? And she tells him, I get it, Mordecai, this is bad. This is real bad. But, but Mordecai, you don't understand. I can't do anything. I'm not in control of anything that happens. Esther explains, I didn't even know this was going on. That's how much anybody tells me anything. I had no idea. And the king, the king seems to have lost interest to in me, and I just can't waltz up and go to him. There are rules that I need to follow. You know that. So Esther, she's basically telling her cousin, I, I would love to help. There's nothing I can do. This is all out of my control. Everything has always been out of my control. Now, all of this, it happened a long, long time ago. I think we get that. We are separated from Esther by time, by culture. I think pretty much now the only place where you see young ladies suddenly becoming queen is in Disney princess fairy tale stories. But still, I think there is a lot that we still do have in common with Esther. And I think part of the reason for that is that a lot of things, unfortunately, have not changed. You think, for instance, the fact we have made a lot of progress, and yet you look at the way our society treats girls, the way our society treats women. We still need to make more progress. Things still aren't always right. Like currently, it's been bothering me, the fact that you'll see stories in the news, people telling young ladies, oh, you're being so brave when they go out and pose in, in hardly anything. And I'm thinking, how is that brave when, when others are using you, when you're being exploited like that? That's not really brave, is it? And there are even still times when it is still dangerous to be a woman in our society, especially if you're somehow different or if people assume, well, is there anyone out there that really would notice if something happened to them, if they disappeared? You think in this country, for instance, of all the Aboriginal families who are still searching for daughters, for sisters that have gone missing, supposedly. There's still a lot of progress that needs to be made. And then you also have that sense of not being in control, the way Esther seemed to have things happen to her. I think especially now, a lot of us can relate to that. I think a lot of us get frustrated. We have a society that keeps saying, well, you can be whatever you want, do whatever you want, just do it. And yet the reality is there's a lot of stuff you've got to do. Some of it is good. You've got to go to school. You've got to find work. You've got to look after yourself. Those are good things you've got to do. But then there's also the messages, oh, if you want to be popular, you've got to do this. If you want to fit in, you've got to do that. And those messages aren't always so good for us. And then on top of that, you've got all the things that have happened in the last few years, the restrictions and missed opportunities because of the pandemic. 
There's the uncertainty many are living with because of the war in Ukraine and now the war in Sudan and now the threat of war over Taiwan. And we have a generation of young people growing up wondering, am I, the way things are going, am I ever going to be able to afford my own place? Am I ever going to be able to, to even afford my own car? I think with all of those things happening, it is kind of tempting to, to try and do what Esther did. Could I just find a nice palace to hide away in and not know what's going on in the rest of the world? That actually sounds pretty good. But the thing is, too, like Esther, we are also part of God's people. We've been chosen by him. There's that verse from Ephesians 2, where the Apostle Paul says, we are God's workmanship. We were created in Christ Jesus to do good works. These good works are things God prepared long in advance for us to do. And so we also live with this sense, God has a plan. He has a plan. He has a purpose for us. But there are times when it can be hard for us not to wonder, as I'm sure Esther probably did. You know, if, if God really has a plan, what is it? What's the plan? Because if there's a plan, God has hidden it really, really well. I'm not sure what he's doing. And there may even be times we wonder, you know, if, if God has a plan, great. But you look at where it's gotten me so far. If God has a plan, why do I feel like I'm stuck, like I have no choices, like like I've got no control over what happens in my life. If, if this is God's plan, maybe we need a better plan. Maybe he's done enough. But I think that gets us to one of the key issues that's really at the heart of the book of Esther. Esther is a weird book, because if you do read it ever from end, beginning to end, and I encourage you to do so, Count how many times the name God shows up, or Lord. You won't find any. God is never mentioned by name in the book of Esther, not even once, and yet, and yet you read it and you know he's there. His fingerprints are somehow all over this story still. And it comes out very clearly, God is very much in control of what happens here. He is sovereign, sovereign over all, even moody kings who have no impulse control themselves, and even bad guys who think they are burdened with glorious purpose. And so Esther's story affirms the fact God is still in control. He is sovereign. But at the same time, Esther's story also insists, it insists this all-powerful God who is in charge of everything that happens, he still expects his people to act. Of course, this shouldn't be anything new for those of us who spent time getting into the Bible. God is in control, but for instance, he still expects Noah, go out and build a boat. God has a plan, but he still tells Abram, you go to the land I will show you. God is going to save his people, but he still sends Noah, go to Pharaoh and tell him to let my, or not Noah, Pharaoh, and go tell my, I've lost, yeah, I lost, I was track of what I was correcting. Talk about not playing with a full deck. <laughs> God is going to save his people, but he still tells Moses, you go to Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go. Then the thing is, what makes Esther's story especially compelling, what makes her situation, I think, very relevant to us, unlike with Noah or, or Abram or Moses, Esther's never, Esther is never given a clear command by God. There's no vision, there's no prophecy, there's no message from on high delivered by an angel. All Esther gets is this desperate plea from cousin Mordecai, who for whatever reason thinks it's up to her that she needs to go to the king, save our people. And at first Esther, of course, she points out how the odds are stacked against her. 
The king, Xerxes, he is moody. He's unpredictable. She's not exactly, am I in his good books or not? Really what she's trying to get across to Mordecai is, you know, I didn't get here where I am in the palace because I planned any of this. I didn't ask for any of this. You know that. I had no say. I've had no control in anything that's happened up to this point. What makes you think that I will have any control over what happens next? And yet cousin Mordecai insists, he insists, there is a plan, there's a bigger plan that is unfolding here, and Esther has a role to play. She is part of it. Deep in his heart of hearts, Mordecai knows that, that God does still have a plan for his people, for Israel, that deliverance will come. Who knows from where, but it's always come before. And so from Mordecai's point of view, it's not by coincidence Esther is where she is now. That it could be you are where you are precisely for such a time as this. Like I said, Esther, she's not been given any kind of specific command by God. She's not given any guarantee this is going to work. And yet, what Mordecai says, his words take hold of her too. And it seems odd, even contradictory, that, that you know, if there really is a God out there, and if he really is ultimately in control of, of everything that happens, well, where, where does that leave us then? If God's in charge, does anything we do actually matter? You might want to think that way, and yet it is this idea, this truth, that since there is a God out there, and since he is in control of, of whatever that happens, Esther takes that, and that's what gives her a sense of purpose. Since there is a God, she is then part of a bigger plan. And what Esther does then, it does matter. Because God is able to take what we do and fill it with meaning, fill it with purpose. Like I said, it does seem kind of odd, even contradictory, that, that for us to find our sense of purpose, that to figure out why we're here and why we matter. The Bible says we first, we first have to accept there is a God, there is someone out there who is bigger, way bigger than us. And this God has everything in his control, including us. We're part of his plan. It seems contradictory, especially because the world keeps trying to tell us that to be happy, to, to find meaning, well, you've got to be in control. you got to call the shots in your own life. Be your own boss. Be the captain of your own destiny. But a big part, a huge part of the good news is precisely the truth that I am not my own. I'm not my own, but belong, body and soul, in life and in death, to someone else, to my faithful Savior. And that, that's part of the power of Esther's story. At first, Esther seems to be someone that things just happen to. She doesn't seem in control of what happens to her, but in the end, she is the one God uses to save his people. She is the one who God chooses to use to keep his plans going, even when bad guys like Haman threaten to undo and ruin everything. The God who rules the universe, who has all of time and eternity in his hands, uses ordinary folks like Esther to keep moving forward with his plans to send a Savior, a Messiah. And it's through him, through that Savior, God has unveiled an even bigger plan that not only is he going to save Israel, he is going to save through Jesus, he's going to save everyone who's willing to put their faith, their trust in him, people from every tribe and nation. And not only is God going to stop bad guys like Haman, he is going to also make right everything in this world that is wrong. And if we believe, we get to be part of that plan, not just later, not just when we're grown up and big enough, but right now. It goes back to what Paul was talking about, how we are God's workmanship, not just to be looked at and admired, but we're to go out. 
We're to go out and do stuff, make a difference. We are to make doing God's will our way of life. We're not called to be the heroes of our own story, but we're called to live faithfully out of God's story. Let's pray. Lord God, our Father in heaven, so often we're told by the world around us that unless we're in control, that we're in charge of what happens to us, unless we make our own decisions and our own destiny, then, then our life doesn't mean anything. That we're just going through the motions without any sense of purpose. But that, that is very different from what we get in your word. According to what you tell us, the fact that you are there, that you are God, and that you have a plan for this world and everyone in it, that is what gives us meaning. That's what gives us purpose. And so, Father, help us to share that good news. Thank you, Lord, that we get to share that, to pass that along with the young women that are part of our GEMS Club. But help us to share that good news with everyone who needs to hear it. We find our sense of purpose. We get to discover who we really are only when we begin living in relationship with you through Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen.